I'm here working uh, with my former student and colleague, uh, Konoku Kamata over there, uh, uh, initiating uh, some work on community organizing uh, and the uh, development of civil society uh, work here uh, in Japan. Um, I'll say a few words about where that comes from and how we're approaching it and why I'm doing it, uh, and then we'll open it up for conversation. <clears throat> we take an approach to leadership that um, is actually rooted in three questions posed by uh, a first century Jerusalem scholar. Because we, we hang what we're doing, the kind of teaching uh, that we're doing and training around leadership, but a particular understanding of leadership. Um, and this understanding grows out of these three questions, which he, when asked, what do we do? How, how do I think about what I do in the world? He responded with three questions. The first was, ask yourself, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Meaning, not a selfish question, but a self-regarding question saying, if you presume to lead, then you better be clear about your own values, your own resources, what you're about, uh, because that's what you're bringing to the, to, the, to, to, the, to the public space. But the second question, he says, to ask yourself to consider, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Which means to be a who and not a what is to recognize that we exist in the world in relationship with others and our capacity to realize our objectives is inextricably bound up with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And thirdly, um, he says to ask yourself, if not now, when? And but that's, that's not about jumping off a bridge. It is about recognizing that much of the time we can only learn what we need to learn in the course of doing, in the course of acting. And that if we wait until we have the perfect plan and we're perfectly prepared and we're perfectly ready to act, we'll get stuck in what Tolstoy called the snare of preparation. We never will act. Because essentially, who can predict the future? <clears throat> who can be prepared? Who can be completely prepared? So the, the, the significance, so for me, leadership is first of all about the interaction of self, other, and action and how those three uh, interact with each other. Um, the fact that these are questions and not answers is also important because when you really reflect on the conditions under which we need leadership, is it when everything is clear? Is it when everything is working? Is it when <clears throat> nothing's new? Is it when all the routines are just fine? Is that when we need leadership? Is that when we want leadership? Isn't it when there's the novel, the contradictory, the dilemma, the, the change, the problem, isn't that when the creative and adaptive skills of leadership are really required? And so what it suggests is that the domain of leadership is not certainty but uncertainty. It's not predictability, but it is the domain of the unexpected. And, and it's our capacity to engage with the unexpected that actually enables us to lead effectively. And it's challenging because it's a challenge to the hands. To, uh, do I have the skills I need to deal with this new situation? Uh, it's a challenge to the head. Can I use those resources I've always relied on in new ways? It's a strategic challenge. And it's a challenge to the heart. How do, how do I find the courage? How do I sustain the hopefulness? How do I inspire that in others to take the risks and to stay the course in order to find our way through uncertainty to purpose? So the definition that I've come to use for leadership is that it's about accepting responsibility for enabling others. So this is not an idea of leadership as a, a brilliant star illuminating everyone that gets close with some light. It's leadership as a form of social interaction, enabling others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty, okay, as, as, as thinking. But now, that suggests that then leadership is a lot more, it's a lot less about knowing than it is about learning. Because the presumption is that circumstances, novel circumstances require learning how to deal with. It also suggests that leadership is less about a position or a person than a process, than practices. Because I think we're all familiar with uh, uh, positions that are filled by people who are supposed to be exercising leadership, but we discover there's a gap often between leadership and authority. 
And so it's a decoupling position from practice. Uh, and we also know that, I've discovered certainly, that uh, leadership uh, is to be found in many, many more places than we think. Uh, often people without formal authority are quite able to exercise leadership. So the focus then is more on practices than it is on position or person. And the five practices that we focus on in our, in our teaching are, are these. Um, the, uh, the first is uh, relationship building, uh, intentional relationship building. Now, I should back up for a moment and say that, that this whole approach was developed, and I'll say a few more words about it in a minute. This whole approach to leadership comes out of uh, not the private sector, but it comes out of the social movement world. Uh, my own background uh, was that I, uh, I grew up in California, uh, uh, Bakersfield, California. My father was a rabbi. My mother was a teacher. I came to Harvard in 1960 as an undergraduate, left after three years to uh, become <coughs> to volunteer for the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, that really was, in that work, was where I really discovered what was going to be my calling for the next 28 years, uh, which was to work in organizing, uh, to uh, try to deal with the problems of inequality uh, and, 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 and injustice. But through, uh, through the practice of uh, mobilizing communities to, act, to use their resources together to develop the power, the capacity they needed to create change. For me, the first experiences of that were in Mississippi and Alabama and in the South, working with the African American community in order to break down the barriers of segregation and change the laws that uh, inhibited uh, racial equality in the United States. And so uh, I began two years in, in the South went back to California, uh, where I had grown up, and then uh, worked with a man named Cesar Chavez, who was organizing migrant farm workers, mostly Mexican immigrants, uh, in agriculture. And we did that for 16 years to organize the first uh, union of agricultural workers. Uh, then another 10 years of union issue and electoral work, uh, until I finally got back to school, uh, because I'd left my senior year pending when I left to go volunteer for the civil rights movement. Uh, got invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard, decided to go, even though I had never graduated. It was strange that they invited me. I'm not sure why that happened, but there, there were other dropouts at Harvard who had actually done quite well financially, like one up in Seattle, Washington, named Bill Gates, but that, that was not me. Uh, but for me, it was a moment of realizing that, that in all my activism, I was feeling stuck. I needed to go deeper and broader intellectually in terms of, of the work I'd been doing, and so decided to go back and, and pick up where I left off. So in 1991, I went back and finished my senior year um, in history and government and graduated class of 64-92. Um, my 81-year-old mother got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate, which was very satisfying for her but then went on, did a master's at the Kennedy School and then PhD in sociology. And while I was working on my PhD, was asked to design a course on organizing the work that I've been doing uh, for the Kennedy School. Now that turned out to be a gift because for me it was a way to integrate my life experience with social science in a conversation with a rising generation uh, whose values I shared. Uh, and, and, and through that conversation developed frameworks, tools, and practices for translating those values into action. And it was through, through that work that I was led back into the world of, of organizing and action uh, in immigration reform work with Howard Dean's campaign in 2003, the Obama campaign in 2007, and so forth. And that's actually how I happened to, to be here. Kanoko was a student in this class uh, two years ago. Uh, and so that's sort of been the, the loop. Now, I say all that to say that, that this framework that we approach things with comes out of that work. And so uh, in organizing, you think of the question you, you start with is, who are my people? And then what is the problem from their perspective? And then how, how can they utilize their resources in ways that they can develop the capacity to deal with the problem? So it isn't about providing social services. And it isn't even about advocating for. It's about enabling a community to act, to use its own capacity in relationship to others to realize its objectives. So in that context, and let's take a sip of water here. 
in that context, where the focus is on developing leadership, building community around leadership, and building capacity from community, these five practices are where we focus. First is relationship building. And so it's intentional. It's, it's the intentional development of new relationships. So it's, it's not getting stuck in given relationships, but understanding how to purposefully develop relationships. It's not simply about networking. And it's not simply about extracting resources from other people. It's about doing the work necessary to determine whether there's enough common interest and values to commit to working together on a common project. This becomes the foundation for particularly the kind of organizing we did for Obama in 2007, where, where Obama was not the establishment candidate, he was the insurgent candidate. And so the establishment candidate, uh, Hillary, could depend on established institutions. We had to build from scratch. And so that meant we had to find individuals from whom we could construct social networks on the basis of which we could build our own organization. So in South Carolina, for example, through a process of organizers identifying individuals who could commit to invite people to their houses, uh, and then from the people coming to the house, get several of them to commit to doing the same thing and sort of create a pattern of geometric uh, spread like that. 400 some house meetings uh, created the foundation for the 15,000 volunteers we were able to turn out on election day to win that primary election. So you can actually get to scale, but it's focused on relationship building with intentionality. Uh, the second is storytelling. And understanding that stories are not just little distractions, but in fact are fundamental ways in which we understand the world. Uh, that what stories are about are how we learn to muster the, the, the emotional resources to make choices under conditions of uncertainty, because that's what happens in a story. A plot moment is exactly that. A plot moment is when someone's proceeding toward a goal, something interferes with that. That's the point we get interested. We're not interested before. It's boring. Uh, and, and we can identify empathetically with the character, the protagonist, and so we feel the challenge, we feel the threat, but we also feel the courage and the hope. We also then can draw learning from the process of identification with the protagonist in the story. So storytelling actually mobilizes the emotional resources required to deal with uncertainty, because that's what happens in a story. Specifically, in, in the context of the kind of uh, leadership work that I've done, the challenge, the, the issue always seems to be, on the one hand, how do you create enough tension to move people out of the habitual into looking at things from a fresh perspective? And that requires tension, urgency. It requires creating real emotional anxiety, re real, yeah, real anxiety. But at the same time, it requires avoiding the default response to anxiety, which is fear, which is to fight, flight, or freeze and take advantage of the cultural resources we've developed to go from fear to hope, to go from isolation to solidarity, to go from, from a sense of self-doubt to self-worth. And a lot of those cultural resources are embedded in the stories that we have learned and that we can deploy. This is why families and cultures and faith traditions all teach through narrative. They're teaching how to access those resources. In the context of the, of the leadership work I do, we, we call it public narrative that we teach how to use narrative to communicate to others why you've been called to what you've been called to. And I use the word called deliberately, not, uh, you know, why is this my job, but what's my mission here? What, what, what am I about? Uh, and what we find in public life is that unless you're able to communicate that, other people will make it up for you. And often they don't make it up for you in ways you might like. We had a candidate for president, John Kerry, who could not, he could not say who he was. He couldn't tell his own narrative. Uh, his opponents, the Swift Boat campaigners, did a very good job of painting a narrative of him that resulted in his defeat. My view is that in public life, increasingly in this cosmopolitan world in which we are living more and more, unless we are able to claim our own narratives and author our own identities, it was different at a time when, when who we are was a function of our gender, our race, our tribe, our community, our position, and people knew all they needed to know about us. That's not true anymore. The world's changing beyond that. And so this responsibility for self-authorship becomes something pretty important, especially in a cosmopolitan domain. 
Second is a story of us, which is how to use narrative to bring out the experience of values that are shared by those whom we hope to mobilize. Third is a story of now, which is how to use narrative to create that sense of challenge, at the same time a source of hopefulness that can enable action. So a self-us now, which sort of parallels those first three questions of Rabbi Hillel, self, us, and now, is sort of the structure of the narratives that we teach. In the Obama campaign, we organized what they called camp, we called them Camp Obamas. This were, these were um, two and a half day training sessions where volunteers came uh, and we structured them into teams and launched them forth to be sort of the bedrock of the campaign. They came thinking they needed to learn Obama's story. We said, no, you're gonna learn to tell your story. And then that's what's gonna engage you with others, learning theirs, and then together you're gonna create a foundation of authentic motivation that's gonna be far more powerful than repeating some politician's claims up here. And in fact, it was so. Third, so we have relationships, we have story, and the third one is strategizing. And of course, we talk a lot about strategizing. This is a big deal, strategy. Everybody does strategy. And the challenge in, in the context I'm familiar with is that we are always doing strategy as insurgents. We are always the little guy up against the big guy. And so the challenge is always how to, how to compensate for lack of resources with greater resourcefulness. I don't know how that translates into Japanese. Uh, it's, it's a nice little pun in English. But in other words, how to compensate for perhaps the wealth or economic might or political might I don't have with being smarter, basically. Being more creative and being more committed. And so how to cultivate that practice, but not simply at the top of an organization, but all the way through. Because when you're building social movements as we are, you don't have that kind of top-down discipline, command and control structure. You have to be able to have strategic thinking going on in action at multiple levels all throughout. And so, uh, and I think my impression is that that's increasingly needed uh, in the economic sector uh, as well. So strategizing. Just one thing about relationship storytelling and strategizing, uh, let me just ask, how many of you have ever had a relationship? Let me see. You ever had a relationship? Any kind of relationship? You ever had one? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I, I hope, yeah, I mean, you're of an age where, okay. Well, well, how about, uh, ever, ever told a story? You ever heard one? Have you ever strategized about anything? Probably strategized about something today. You know, maybe, maybe you got up late or something. And so you still have to come. My point is that these are natural, these are things we're hardwired to do. And so a lot of the work we do is taking what's implicit and making it explicit so we can bring intentionality and purpose and, and, and sort of bring the craft to what are actually we're equipped to do. Lots of us are equipped to do. Fourth, action. Fourth, practice. It's fine to have a strategy, but unless that strategy turns into something measurable, clear, and specific outcomes, then what do you have? Now, of course, if you're used to counting financial outcomes, that's one thing. If you're used to counting electoral outcomes, that's one thing. In a lot of the groups I work with, it's much, it's much less clear than that. How do you decide if you're improving education? Test scores are not really much of an indicator. You know, so how do you, but the reality is that unless you can find ways to measure what you're doing and count what you're doing uh, in this whole world, how do you learn? How do you evaluate? How do you know? So the question of turning like an election campaign, not just when it gets to the votes, it's too late then, beforehand to know how to monitor, count, and evaluate your progress is a critical question, and that goes to action. In the context of organizing and volunteer work, the key issue is commitment. The key issue is learning how, because you, you're not paying people to do things. People have to commit to do them. They have to volunteer. And so eliciting a volunteer commitment is a little, it's challenging. And, and it's, very, it, it's often very hard for us to really ask other people to commit. Uh, and, and, and so it, it gets down to very simple, basic things. All right, fifth, last one. Um, the last one, structuring. How do we create structures, then organizational structures, to support these four practices? Now, you know, uh, the, the old way was you had command and control. You had somebody who was a boss, told everybody else what to do. Um, that has not been working very well. Uh, in my uh, experience, it's not working very well in almost any sector. Um, and uh, even though it persists, 
uh, because if we were all producing a, a hundred identical widgets all the time, it might. Uh, but the problem is that's not the world we're operating in. Now, sometimes because of our reaction to that kind of, that kind of structure, we say, okay, we're all leaders. We're just all going to have everybody, you know, no structure. Uh, but then that leads to what uh, a feminist sociologist called the tyranny of structurelessness, the pretense that human beings can actually operate without structure. And her point is that any time a group of people get together, they're going to structure themselves. And it may not be visible, it may be not acknowledged, it may be off the books, it may be in secret, but it's going to happen. So better to be deliberate. What we've been working with the last several years is structures based actually on the work of my colleague, Richard Hackman, who passed away a few years ago, who's uh, the social psychologist uh, who has probably studied and understood teams better than just about anyone, uh, leadership teams. In other words, purposefully constructed and designed collaborative interdependent leadership teams that are self-governing with the capacity to generate more teams. In other words, where teams generate teams generate teams, a kind of in a cascading kind of process. We got to experiment with this in the, in the Obama campaign to scale because the traditional form was you recruited a volunteer leader, they would then burn out or else they would complain that nobody would help them. What we did from the beginning was launch teams with shared purpose, with shared norms, with clear roles. We, we paid a lot of attention to, to the team launching. The result was that, that it wasn't perfect, but the result was that the, the sustained motivation and accountability and use of individual resources because the teams were interdependent making use of people's different capacities was, was so much greater than anything that I had ever seen before. In the general election in Ohio, the campaign was based on 11,000 such local teams. Uh, so volunteers, volunteers organized in local teams like that. So what we've been working at is more uh, developing more, more collaborative, team-based structures of leadership as ways to uh, develop uh, or utilize these other four practices. Underlying all of this, then, is, is, a, is a prime commitment to the work of leadership development because the assumption here is then the riches or the real asset, and in the case of the kinds of organizations I work with, they don't have a lot of financial resources. What they have is people. And the investment, then, in developing human capacity becomes the most important thing, uh, not as, uh, not as uh, cogs in a machine, but with the capacity to uh, build relationships, uh, to motivate and inspire themselves and others, to strategize, uh, and to uh, move to action and work collaboratively. So uh, that's kind of what I'm doing. Uh, and uh, as I said, so at the Kennedy School, I, I teach um, a course um, on organizing in the spring, where people do actual organizing projects. Uh, so the class, people do the work. We, it's uh, reflective practice. So people are learning theory and practice at the same time. We do a distance learning version of the same class. We have usually about 100, 150 students in 20 countries that we do in the spring. In the fall, I teach a class called Public Narrative, which just focuses on the narrative piece in which there's a lot of interest. Uh, this fall, we had 140 students from 31 countries. That's the exciting thing, is, is the opportunity to learn uh, this stuff in such an international and cosmopolitan uh, kind of context like that. Uh, and I also work with undergraduates. and then. Aside from that, we're working at developing kind of a, a loose network of people who are interested in this kind of work, uh, like uh, working with Konoko here in Japan. We did our first workshops in Beijing two years ago with uh, NGO leaders over there uh, in the Balkans and elsewhere, where people seem to have an interest in trying to find new ways to organize themselves uh, that aren't all over here just individuals, but aren't the old way of all top down but trying to find that middle ground that might be a good way into the future. So let me just stop there, and we can go from there. Introduction about what you're doing, and uh, it's very clear. And you mentioned about five things about uh, how to uh, organize people. One is relationship with building with intentionally. Second is storytelling. And third is about strategizing. <laughs> Fourth is about action and practices. And fifth is about structuring. And uh, you mentioned also about uh, public narrative. Mm. Could you please tell us about like, uh, what is public narrative and how it works and what is the key to success in public narrative? So public narrative is the part I was talking about under storytelling. Okay. Uh, it's, it's 
we teach it as a leadership as the le as a leadership skill, mm -hmm. using narrative, okay. uh, so as to communicate, um, uh, so as to so as to mobilize the shared values around which we're operating. Um, it's sort of based on the recognition that um, if if values are to mean any, values are emotional in content, they're not intellectual abstractions. And we map the world cognitively. We map the world, uh, you know, as it is, and that's real helpful for strategy. Mm -hmm. But we also map the world affectively. We attach value: what's uh, frightening, what's uh, inspiring, what's uh, what uh, we love, what we don't like, what what. And that second mapping, that emotional mapping of the world, is uh, one way of understanding value. Mm -hmm. And so the content of values is emotion. Now, if we, so, so if we're going to work on values, we have to have a way to access the emotional content of, of them and communicate that and share it and challenge it and express it. And so narrative, we're teaching narrative as a way to speak the language of values, which is to speak the language of emotion, but specifically with respect to the question of agency. With the, with, with, and by agency, I don't mean the way my colleague um, at the business, uh, I, by agency, I mean the capacity, there's a Japanese word we were talking about. The capacity to decide and act. Okay. And, and that presumes a capacity not to have simply a theoretical capacity, but also the emotional capacity. And see, this goes to the, to, to the point that when, when we, and I mentioned this before, when we're confronted with challenges, uh, the hard wiring that was developed when we were wandering around the jungles or wherever we were wandering around in Africa, uh, whenever we saw something uh, unexpected, the surveillance system in the brain uh, told us, you know, look out, look out, look out. And we experienced that as anxiety. And, and the hard wiring response we developed was to run away or to fight or to freeze. Now, that may have been useful at that time. It's not very useful today. And so over the years, we've developed this, the culture has enabled us to learn other ways to avoid reacting, but rather responding. And response is intentional and purposeful, as opposed to reaction, which is, which is not purposeful, but reactive. And, and that's sort of the work of narrative. So it's on the one hand to recognize that in leadership situations, we're, we're often challenged with, on the one hand, creating the tension that can produce anxiety, but on the other hand, needing cr to create the sense of hopefulness and possibility that can um, inspire the ability to deal with what's coming down. And it's sort of both. And that's the heart of what that's about. And, it, and linking the self, other, in action is, is that if I'm going to make claims on others to join me in something, what's my moral authority for that? Not, I may have a position, I can tell them what to do. That's not about leadership. You know, what, what, wh wh why? Why take me seriously? Uh, and I can list my resume and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about some stories about why, why I care about what I care about. If you listen to the first seven minutes of Barack Obama's speech to the Democratic Convention in 2004 when he introduced himself to the United States and the world really, the first seven minutes you will hear a story of self a story of us and a story of NAFT. You will hear all three. Uh, if we had time, we could YouTube one of my students, uh, James Croft. Five minutes, you will hear a self, an us, and a now. And you'll see, it, it's much better to sort of experience than for me to talk about it. You'll kind of see what I mean about the way to bring values alive in, in an emotional understanding. And in that way, um, in that way, people are really there ready to do the strategic work and all the rest of it. Uh, uh, just the last thing I'll say is my, my, my dissertation was on strategy because I was very interested in that. But what I discovered in the context in which I worked was that strategy, trying to understand strategy from a pur purely analytic perspective was very limited because you're strategizing in the unknown. You're strategizing in the uncertain and in the future. And it had much more in common with creativity with the conditions that made for creativity. And if you look at what makes for creativity, there's, there's skill, there's you know, the, the, the skill, uh, there's uh, the, the setting in which uh, there can be ongoing learning, and at the core of it, though, 
is motivation, is commitment, desire, passion, is, is the depth of a pursuit and the passion of pursuit that enables one to hang in there and find new ways. Uh, because it's not easy to find new ways. I mean, it's, 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 it's tough. It's, and so, so it turns out the link between strategizing and motivation, which is the work of story, is not that distant. They're opposite sides, I think, of the same thing. How to act with agency. One is about the emotional capacity, the other is about the cognitive capacity. And if you link the two, then you've got something that can in enable the hands to actually do good work, I think. You mentioned about strategy, strategizing. Yeah. What is it like a strategizing? You mentioned about like a creative and uh, mobilizing yeah. community. How do you like, uh, tell us more about what is strategizing? Like, uh, well, in, in the context that, that I'm familiar with, it's, it's um, I use it as a, as a verb, I say it as a verb, not a noun, because in my experience, the real work of strategy is not in the plan. It starts there. But, uh, you know, but that's only where it starts. <laughs> Uh, then when all that stuff starts happening, then how you respond, it seems to me, is where really the, that's where the difference is between the great strategist and the poor one, uh, who's able to take advantage of opportunities, who recognizes problems and is able to adapt. So it's an adaptive capacity. It's the ongoing capacity to, in real time, maneuver, change, and adapt. In, elector in a political campaign, you are constantly doing that. Uh, you, you have to constantly be able to shift and move because you're dealing with an opponent who's doing new things. And so it's that, it's that kind of resourcefulness. And, and the tricky part, there's a lot of tricky parts to it, but um, the tricky part is that, that, well, the word strategy is interesting because it comes from the Greek. Uh, uh, strata was the word for field, and it was the, field used for, it was the word used for army because you put an army on a field, a strata. The general was called the strategos. So the general was up on a hill overlooking the field, the, strat the strategos. The ranks of soldiers down here, what do you think they were called? Ranks of soldiers. They were called tacticas. Okay? Okay. That's where we get tactics. Okay. So see, the strategos was the plan, and the tacticas was the action. Now, the problem is that you have to be able to see the view from down here at the same time as up there. <laughs> to do good strategy, in my experience, you can't just be up there, because fog intervenes, and you say, oh, I don't, I don't know. And if you're just down here, all you see is what's right there. So how you bring both perspectives into view, it seems to me, is one of the real challenges in, in doing effective, and being able to do it quickly, so you're able to move quickly. In, in electoral campaigns, we design systems to do that. In social movement campaigns, it's challenging. Uh, but uh, that's one reason why equipping people in a decentralized way with the capacity to do their strategizing. And, and I mean, the definition I use for strategy is just how to turn what you have into what you need to get what you want. I, I mean, how to turn your resources into the power you need to achieve your goal. Now, for the work I've been doing, power is always a critical question how to create capacity. Um, for example, the, the uh, sort of the key event in the American Civil Rights Movement that sort of initiated it, that I learned so much from, was the um, effort to integrate buses in Montgomery, Alabama. This was Dr. King's first big campaign, 1955, because the buses there operated with blacks in the back, whites in the front, an armed deputized bus driver, so a black person would get on, have to walk by the deputized bus driver, pass rows of white people, find a seat, uh, and then if a white person wanted the seat, have to get up and give it to them. Going to work, coming home twice a day. Just think about how that makes you feel. And, and the Supreme Court had said that segregation was unconstitutional in schools. So the people in Montgomery said, oh, let's try and get rid of it in the buses. So they said, let's file a lawsuit. Well, but what happened was, uh, they're, they're the, pers the, the person that was going to file the lawsuit, Rosa Parks was her name, she refused to get up from the white section, so they arrested her. The community decided that they needed to support her by all staying off the buses. They surprised themselves in that they all stayed off the buses because when people lack power, they often doubt that they can stand together. 
And they looked that next morning, and everybody was off the buses. They amazed themselves. They said, wow, look what we just did. They stayed off the buses for a year. They walked to work. They had carpools. They found other ways. And what they discovered then, that, that the resource they needed for power, they didn't have to go to the Supreme Court. They didn't have to go to the Congress. They had that resource right in their feet. Everybody had feet. And all they had to do was decide to use them together. And if they used them together, then collectively the bus company was more dependent on them than they were on the bus company for the economic resources of their bus fare. So how to translate resources into power is the heart of the strategic question in the work that I've been doing. And how to translate ordinary resources that lots of people have access to into power. Uh, and uh, Gandhi did it with salt in India. Uh, the American colonists in my country did it with tea. Um, so there's something, that's kind of the particularities of strategy, but I think generally it's the, it's the most creative uh, aspect of this kind of work and could be wonderfully exciting, I think. I have uh, one or two questions. One is about, um, you mentioned about all the strategy and also action and so forth about like uh, uh, storytelling and so forth. There are two different movements. One is about the movement with leaders, like uh, Martin Luther King mm -hmm. or like uh, Obama. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question would be, this, with this strategy and all those like, uh, storytelling and so forth, I think leader does matter, like mm -hmm. uh, who, who acts as a leader. And what kind of trait of char character or personality or capacity is needed as a good leader? That's my question. Yeah, it's a really tough question because I, uh, yeah, see, I think we, get too, we may get too stuck on that. Mm. Um, okay. It's kind of like, uh, let me put it this way. What makes for a good soccer player? Mm. What makes for good, now, now, let me ask, what makes for a good soccer team? Mm. Okay, well, you need this, you need this, you need this, you need this. How often do you find it in one person? Mm. Mm, so much. So you have a soccer team. Mm. Now, why do we expect in leaders all that to be in one person. Okay. Uh, that's why I think leadership teams are so important because it's rare among us and it's problematic. It's very problematic. Mm. The people that I've worked with who uh, have acquired sort of charismatic status, okay. it's a myth usually mm. because usually they're, they aren't like that. They have their teams, they work with other people and they wind up uh, terribly isolated as human beings mm. They wind up uh, as icons. They wind up with demands made on them that are inhuman. Mm -hmm. uh, often they sort of lose their balance. Mm -hmm. And it undermines very often the whole enterprise that they've been trying to create. And, you know, we know about founder syndromes and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so there's something psychologically very problematic about that. And I think the alternative is to think more broadly about developing our leadership capacities mm -hmm. and how we structure those capacities. Well, uh, the second question is about how do you actually implement all the strategy and also storytelling, and who, what is the organization required? Because of leadership, you, know, you may not need a leader, and, uh, but you may need a leader, but it's more important about what is the storytelling, how do you, uh, like a strategizing, yeah. what, what is the structure? Yeah. Like what is the team you need? Like, is it like a, you know, what kind of people are behind? See, I think it's, I think it's really interesting because I think we're, we're learning a lot about that right now. Um, I think one, one of the interesting uh, case studies in this uh, is, um, uh, I mentioned my former colleague Richard Hackman who, who studied so much of this. He was very interested in symphony orchestras. Um, he discovered that one of the orchestras, one of the highest levels of job dissatisfactions in the world was concert musicians. <laughs> Now, why would that be? Think about that. For why would that be? Why? Yeah. See, here's people who are creative. They're trained. They have talent. They love what they're doing. They have passion for it. And you know what they're told? You're a cog in a machine. You do what I say. You know, if you watch uh, Zubin Mehta, you act uh, Ozawa, anybody, you do what I say. So a, a group of younger musicians came out of Juilliard, and they formed something called the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, and they have no conductor. They have leadership. They have leadership. See, they don't say they're not, a, but they don't have a conductor. They have leadership teams. They have a managing team. They have teams for the different productions. 
And there's a video about this that we, it's a case study we did, and, and it's a video that we used to teach, just to sort of shake people's notions up a little bit and say, no, there's different ways to organize authority so as to support the exercise of leadership. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, th that's one way to approach it. Uh, in, and, uh, you know, in social movements, usually it's a combination. Uh, usually you have uh, a body that's electing uh, a core group, uh, and then responsibility is delegated. But the more it's delegated through team structures, and co it's the idea of thinking, I guess this is one other thing, I, the idea of understanding leadership as interdependent. In other words, I am not a failure because I need someone else. The, the idea that leadership somehow is about being invulnerable is fundamentally flawed. You know, a, a, at least in my experience, if you think of people who have really extraordinarily excelled at leadership, they are quite capable of acknowledging their limits and recognizing their need for others. And I think we get stuck in a box where we think, oh, unless I'm perfect and make no mistakes, then I can't lead. Well, that is not the real world. And what we wind up doing then is becoming uh, risk averse. Uh, we fear failure, we fear imperfection, and we fail to act. And that's the real failure, is the failure to act. And so, so yeah, it's trying to get clear from the get-go. It's about interdependence. It's about understanding what the, what the interdependent capacities are we need to create. It just seems to me a much more promising way to think about this than imposing these uh, false expectations on ourselves that we really can't meet and are dysfunctional to begin with. So collaborative structures, distributed leadership structures, team structures, I think, because you have to have accountability, you have to have uh, 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 learning, you have to have all those needs. There's no question about that. But it doesn't have to be done just one old way. One question I have is about the, re the recent movement, like Tea Party movement. Ah, yeah. There's no leader, and uh, there's no public leader, and we don't know who is a leader, That's myself, like from our side. And, uh, um, you know, let's forget about their opinion, whether it's, <laughs> it's good or right. Or uh, yeah, let's, let's forget let's about Let's forget about their action, whether it's, <laughs> it's good, or, uh, good or bad. But in that movement, there must be some, like, collective, coll collective uh, leaders who are working on it to think about storytelling, yeah. about you know, strategizing action and structure. And, uh, and what do you think about that? Is it working or it's not working? Yeah, it's and uh, do you need a leader or you don't need a leader? Yeah. Well, again, it's, it's a great. Now, social movements are weird animals, okay? Uh, I mean, we've had a lot of them in the United States. Um, and partly it's because our political structure is very, um, very flawed. It's very fragmented. Uh, it's it's been kind of dysfunctional recently, if anybody's taken a close look at how Congress has been operating. Uh, and so we have relied on social movements for sources of change much more than might be the case if we had a more uh, fluid political structure. And so civil rights movement, women's movement, so forth, have been much more important factors, environmental movement. And movements are, are they're, they're rag raggedy. <laughs> uh, there's usually multiple organizations, not just one. Uh, and then within those organizations, they certainly have their structures. Some are more horizontal, some are more vertical, some are more top-down, some are more... Uh, and there are more or less degrees of collaboration among the leadership, between the leadership of these organizations. In the Civil Rights Movement, uh, there were five major organizations. They fought, they cooperated. There was a venue where they could at least argue with each other. Um, so there's a kind of looseness to movements that kind of has to do with the nature of them. Um, Occupy was an interesting moment in the U.S. because it was a, a tactic that was kind of in search of a strategy. In other words, because there was no structure beyond what was right there. So they didn't have a structure that allowed them to strategize, to cross locality, and there it was kind of the absence of any structure beyond the local unit that kept them from developing, I, I think. Because in the U.S., unless you're organizing translocally, you can't build enough power to have, have much influence. So that's the reason why uh, Occupy failed. And well, that's the reason why the Tea Party is still moving on, going on. I think there are, there are other reasons, but I think that's one reason. Uh, I mean, I think there's other reasons it had to do with access to resources. Uh, with, uh, it had to do with the demographics of American politics and the fact that there is a core uh, 
constituency that is very threatened by the demographic changes in the United States that have to do with immigration, that have to do with gender, that have to do with generation, uh, that have them very frightened and they are very, very fearful. And that drives a lot of what the Tea Party is about. It's sort of like trying to put up walls and trying to stop change. And, and this, it's happening most in the places that are most threatened by the new, by the, what's, what's happening, by the future that's coming. So there's other factors, but, uh, but that's certainly one. Do you think Tea Party is like a self-motivated volunteers who are organizing it, and there's something like a, some, some power or resources behind? Both. I, it's, okay. it's both. Uh, there's definitely a core of people who are really uh, believers out there, uh, and then there's definitely people like the, the, the Koch brothers and others who have ideological political agendas and a lot of resources to back it up with who support it. And so it's, it's it rarely are these things always just one or the other. And so it's a sort of a convergence there, I think, is what's going on. You've been doing this research for about, let's say, for 40, 50 years. Yeah, I guess you can call it research. Uh, no, uh, research <laughs> or like a practices yeah. or active, like, a, you know, or activist. Yeah. You know, and then during the course is technology advanced yeah. and the social media internet. Uh, very interesting, yeah. And how did it evolve? Yeah. What changed? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's one of the really exciting things today is 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 learning is learning uh, learning how to use it, le learning what it means, and I think we're in a real learning curve right now. I mean, I am reminded though that in 1848, every country in Europe had a revolution, uh, very quickly one on the other, and the main technology were guys on horses with leaflets, and so it, you know uh, people have always found ways to communicate. Uh, and of course, we're in a whole different context right now with the internet and all that. Uh, and and I, the distance learning I get to do to work with students all over the world, it's wonderful. It's a, it's an incredible opportunity. It's not like um, it's not like uh, you know one way asymmetric learning. We create a real interactive learning space where somebody in Jordan can role play with somebody in Mexico uh, who are working on similar problems and learn from each other. That's really great. That's that's great stuff. Um, but it's tricky because there's some confusion about whether a house is built by a carpenter or a hammer. <laughs> and there's, a, you know, people came along and sort of said, oh, the internet is going to do this, this, this. Well, y the best hammers in the world don't build houses. You still need carpenters. You need the, the, the capacity to strategize, to know how to use the tools. So that's one very important thing. Another interesting thing is the distinction we make between mobilizing and organizing. Now, mobilizing, turning out a whole lot of people for an event, or getting a whole lot of clicks on a, on a, you know, on a website, or getting a lot of names on a, on a petition, that's like a one-shot deal. That's very different than building infrastructure with leadership, with capacity for strategizing, for decision-making, and having organizational continuity. Now, in the old days, to turn out the numbers of people they turned out in Takrir Square, you would have had to have had a real infrastructure of leadership. They didn't need it. They were able to do it over the internet. They were able to do it at much lower cost, much easier. All those people came out. They achieved their initial objective. Who collected the benefits? The people who did the mobilizing or the people who had the organization? Initially, the Muslim Brothers and the military. So unless we combine the mobilizing with the organizing, then it, it's, it's a risky business. Now, nobody really kind of thought about it that way until we saw the results of that and said, oh, wait a second. Uh, this, is, this is not, it looks really cheap in the short run, but guess what? In the long run, <laughs> not so good. We need to go back and do the kind of foundation building in order to be able to mobilize in such a way that we can actually consolidate what we, what we want. That you had uh 400 house meetings yeah. for, and 800 volunteers. Oh no, 15,000 volunteers. Oh, 50,000 volunteers, and that has become the foundation. And that cannot be done by internet or social media. It, you can help. See, you can use, no, and we, oh use, we use them sure, in social sure. media. In other words, uh, you, uh, we use the internet to, um, uh, for people to sign up, uh, to share information, yeah, yeah. wonderful for sharing information. Uh, we can do teaching over the internet. Uh, coaching. Um, what's hard is to build the kind of horizontal rela committed relationships. That's, there, there's two very tricky things. One is, you see, it's one thing, move on, for example, uh, that was able to, you know, 
mobilize lots and lots of uh, emails and so forth. It's a few people mobilizing millions of people, nothing in between. Um, that um, is, it's actually very limited in what it can accomplish. It's pretty reactive. Um, because what they're not doing is building connections of those people to each other. And it's the horizontal relationships is where the new capacity is created. See, being a dot with a lot of arrows pointing to you is a very limited structure. Having a dot that goes to a few dots, that goes to a few, that goes to a few, that becomes a strong structure. A lot harder to do because the tendency is to want to like be like change.org or purpose.org or avaz, where it's just mobilizing lots of clicks and dots. So how to create horizontal structures that then become sort places of deliberation. Because another thing we know is that when people get into relationship with each other, they learn. Individuals just left on their own. What's your opinion? Answering a poll. What is, what's your opinion? You answer. What's your opinion? You answer. Now, to treat that as developed thought is a big mistake. You get people into conversation with each other where they can learn from each other, develop their deeper understanding of each other. You get to a whole other level of understanding. And organizations need to do that, too. And see, so with people just existing in individual silos all over the place, what's happening to our capacity for common understanding? Alexis de Tocqueville, who, who uh, came to the US and, and wrote a lot about American democracy in the 1830s, he thought civic associations were so important in our country because they were a counter to the individualism that he feared would undermine democracy. Because you have to have places where people do the work of discovering common interests. That takes learning and relationship. Uh, it's not that you can't do it on the internet, but it, it takes an extra effort. Um, and, uh, and then the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the building of relationships, the building of horizontal relationships, the development of capacity for strategizing. Now, we've also used the internet very well where we have organizations and then we meet online. I mean, we had a conference of our network this summer. We had 150 people for a five-hour session on WebEx. Uh, we had one-on-one -on -one meetings, we had breakout sessions, we had uh, discussion groups uh, in different rooms. You can do all that. It's great, but we were a pre-existing group. So, like I say, I, I think we're, we're learning how to use this uh, stuff. In terms of mobilizing or communicating or, uh, let's say, um, and at the same time learning, the you know, internet is use useful, but organizing, it's not going to be easy. It's just by internet. That will help. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to meet face-to-face. -face. You have to have some kind of inspir inspiration I think and so. the motivation. And at the same time, you have to have some kind of emotional attachment and uh, some kind of action. It's going I to really be think so, because I think yeah. if we leave out the emotional communication, we're leaving out the values. In other words, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a trivial thing. Uh, and I s when, when the first time I started teaching on the internet and realized we could see each other, and people could see each other real time. Boy, that was a different deal. I mean, it's just a whole other level of communication because of the emotional communication possible through the nonverbals, the way in which we, we, we communicate. So we, we remain human beings, thankfully, I think. Uh, and so we still need to communicate as human beings do, even though we have all these wonderful new technologies to use. So if you have a good s strategy and structure, and also storytelling, <laughs> you can make a president. And uh, the president or leader is a good communicator or like a good in terms of emotional you know, uh, rapport and building relationship. He or she could be elected. However, that could be different from actually being a president and make a good performances. No kidding, president. no <laughs> kidding, that's for sure. <laughs> well, let's ask you know, like whoever has a any questions. Okay, Brian. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm from the U.S. I've been living in Japan. Where? Uh, from Oregon, but I went to Tufts just down the road and oh, to Fletcher, okay. actually. Hi. <laughs> so I don't think I've ran into you before, but thank you for coming. And um, at Globus, I work in the educational part. Uh, uh, at Globus, we, we focus on helping students find their personal mission, their passion, yeah. and then creating a network to support that. Yep. And uh, What's your opinion on how to foster uh, group leadership without being the leader ourselves? Because we're just staff, you know? We want the students to, to take leadership themselves, and, and it's kind of hard to, especially with really diverse 
you know, people from 15 different countries yeah. for 30 people. Yeah. What, what should we do? <laughs> what do you recommend? <laughs> well, here's one, two. No, I don't want to. I don't want to. No, it's no. Well, but I, a couple of suggestions. Um, one is, you see, actually, when we were first launching these teams of the Obama uh, campaign, um, we realized that there's sort of groundwork that really matters. Um, and the, the one on, um, first of all, uh, working with people on their narrative, uh, learning how to do what we call a story of self. Now, it's not your resume. It's actually, um, it's a bit challenging because it's sort of learning how to uh, communicate something about why you were called from uh, a story about something in your life that, that often, you know, gave you some insight or, or put you on the path toward what, what you're doing. Uh, and it's real, and uh, often people are uh, resistant um, because often the things that put us on our pathway, they may have some pain attached to them, but they also have some hope attached to them. I'm not talking about therapy, but I am talking about capturing the, um, the moral resources, the things that, get, that, gave our, that give our lives value, and, and that we can communicate most powerfully through narrative. And so the first thing we do is, is uh, teach people how to do that or train people on how to, how to tell their stories of self and, and share them. And, uh, and, uh, and w in the training, we teach you how to do a two-minute version of your story of self. I mean, it, because it's about real focus and getting down to the point and so forth. And, and everybody says, um, uh, we don't do that in our culture, I should just say. Uh, the first time we did it in England, no, Brits don't do it, it's an American thing. <laughs> Uh, Jordan, no, Arabs don't do it, it's an American thing. And, you know, now we're hearing J Japan, no, J we don't do it. Yeah, But everybody eventually discovers that it's a pretty useful thing to do. Now, the value of that is that it, 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 it creates uh, some common awareness of each other's values. And the relational work of like a one-on-one -on -one meetings also enables people to learn something about each other's interests and their resources. So you have a foundation to work with. Then we would go through a formal team launching. And in a team launching, we focus on three exercises. The first is a shared purpose. And the shared purpose exercise is, sort of, is, is building on the values and interests and that we've learned now about each other. Because even though we're all over the world and all this stuff, there's going to be a lot of common stuff. And, and the differences will become uh, value, uh, valuable. I mean, in other words, if there's enough commonality of value, then the differences become assets, not liabilities. That's the point. So it's like doing enough to find the common ground. It's not 100% common, 10% of common ground. Just enough common ground to make the differences assets as opposed to liabilities. And people see that and they get that. So then our shared purpose, what's our goal? Uh, you know, with whom, well, what are we doing? Then uh, norms, uh, you know, it's right out of textbook. I mean, how are we gonna decide, uh, hold each other accountable, uh, our norm corrections, roles, what are we gonna have? Uh, and, then, uh, and then we launch, and then our role becomes coaching. And the first session in the trainings we do, the workshop we're gonna do here, the first thing we, we teach is coaching. We, we, in other words, coaching as a core leadership practice, because if you think of leadership as about enabling others, then, then it isn't so much about giving orders as it is about coaching people in being successful at what their undertakings are. And so it's thinking of coaching much more as a leadership practice than telling. Uh, you've accepted responsibility for this mission or task, your team, you as a person. So now my job is to enable you to succeed. And so I'm working with you to enable you to succeed. And so it's learning how to ask questions. It's learning how to distinguish between strategic and informational uh, and, uh, and motivational challenges. And there's a whole little, little art of coaching, little practice of coaching uh, that can be enormously helpful. So then you become a coach and you're coaching your team. Uh, and then they learn from that how to coach their own teams. And then you get a cascade going, just like that. No, I mean, I, I don't mean to make light of it at all, but there is methodology for this. It isn't, it isn't, uh, it isn't uh, mysterious or otherworldly. Okay, other questions? Maybe, maybe on the comments. Marsha san, uh, very thank you, thank you for your heartfelt speech. My question is about Japan. Yeah. We haven't seen a social movement like the Obama campaign in Japan, but uh, you talked about horizontal leadership. We do have festivals. Obon festivals, uh -huh. New Year festival, yeah. 
And uh, at those festivals, we see a lot of horizontal leadership yeah. in the region. Yeah. So my question to you is, if you were here in Japan, and you, how, how to say, incorporated the five practices, can we have a social movement like the Obama <laughs> campaign to create you know, a, a better Japan here, e starting from Tokyo? Well, I guess the first thing I'd, I'd, I'd say is that I think I've learned enough not to answer the question. Oh, uh, right. No, what I mean is, uh, I think that would be a question you would have to answer. Mm. I think that, that, obviously, from what I've been saying, cultural resources are enormously important. Because if you're, if you're operating in the domain of narratives and relationships, and I say cultural resources, not just cultural barriers, cultural resources. And uh, since I've been working in the Islamic world, I've learned so much about traditions and practices and resources. Uh, the story of the Prophet's journey from Mecca to Medina becomes a way to teach community building. And so uh, I think it's a question of, of identifying values and sources within a particular context for what you want to do. And I think what you've just cited is a great illustration. I'd heard in, uh, is it uh, Nagano pro province, about the, the, the health collaborative? the health advisor collaborative that they have there. Really interesting, not top down, horizontal, community taking responsibility for its own health. That's really uh, interesting stuff. So I would be looking for uh, those kinds of seeds uh, or, or threads or whatever and think, oh, how do I stitch that together? Uh, history matters, uh, the historical narratives matter, uh, the cultural narratives matter. These are all really important resources uh, if we're going to go into the domain of the heart, if we're going to go into uh, exploration, courage, all that, we need to draw on those things. And so uh, I have been amazed. The richness of cultural resource here is phenomenal. And uh, we're going next week down to Nara and Kyoto and Ise and, and just to try to learn more about the, uh, the, the origins. And, uh, and I think everybody needs to do that and understand that. Who else? Maybe. Thank you very much for a very great talk. I think this opportunity is great beneficial for us workers. Thank, Thank you very much. And my question is about um, higher education admission policy. Oh. What do you think about affirmative action, especially about racial issue in, in the United States? I have catched up on um, recent Supreme Court just, justice decision yeah. making, and there seem to be very different period in the United States, yeah. um, ab especially about racial di diversity. Yeah. There are some universities which change their policy they um, focus more on socioeconomic status issues, yeah. not on racial issues. Yeah. What do you think about it? No, I, I think that, um, well, first, I think the decoupling of social economic from racial was a big mistake to begin with because they're deeply interrelated in our country. In, in the United States, there's a deep interrelationship between the two. Uh, and, and I think that one of the strange things that's happened since the 60s in the United States is that there has been progress on terms of gender and racial openness, um, but backwards in terms of, of economic equality. And so it's sort of been like the, the pyramidal structure of society has grown more, it's, more, it's grown sharper, although the color of it has changed a little bit. And, and I think that's very problematic. Uh, I think it's really problematic. Uh, Jefferson and some of the early founders said the biggest threat to democracy was inequality because, uh, because inequality of power is what it translates into. That's the problem. And th the whole premise of democracy is that concentrations of power are not a good thing uh, because uh, human beings are what they are and, and we don't handle excess well. We don't uh, appreciate accountability if we can avoid it. Uh, and so we need, we all need to be accountable. We all need ways of account. And the sort of the original conception of democracy was a, a mechanism of accountability, basically. It wasn't about we're all gonna agree. It was, it was contentious. It was about holding one another accountable. And so extreme inequality is fundamentally uh, contradictory to the premise of, of democratic practice. And so I think that's really problematic in my country right now. And I think the direction we're going in. Uh, affirmative action, uh, I think, was very important. I think it remains very important. Uh, it's very strange what's going on in the United States right now. We seem to be revisiting issues that we thought we had settled long time ago, like voting rights. Uh, and we're revisiting the whole question of 
uh, access to voting in, in states like Texas and, and uh, South Carolina and so forth, where we thought 50 years ago uh, it was all, all done. And we've been going through this strange 50th anniversary of everything right now. Uh, President Kennedy's assassination is 50 years ago. March on Washington was 50 years ago. Uh, for me personally, it's like sort of a revisiting, you know, of the time I decided to get involved in the movement. And so it's been a very kind of rich time of, of, of reflection. And on the one hand, I never thought that when we were doing civil rights, we would have an African-American president. That was like amazing and unthinkable. But I also never thought we'd be revisiting these, these issues now uh, about voting rights and so forth. So it's an ongoing struggle. Um, and uh, I, think the, I think affirmative action remains very important. Uh, the action has shifted a little bit. Uh, the, dem the demography of the US is changing radically. And I think that's what has a lot of the Tea Party folks really frightened. Uh, states like California are majority uh, non-white. That's the future of the United States. I think it's a positive future. I think it's a constructive future, one that has to be embraced. It, it, that, that is how our country, people say the United States doesn't have revolutions, it has immigration. Uh, in other words, the real forces for change. And uh, you know, the first agricultural unions, I mean, I was organizing farm workers unions in California within the Mexican community. The first agricultural workers unions organized in the United States were organized by Japanese immigrants at the turn of the century between 1900 and 1919 the first effective unions. They were able to raise wages by up to 50%. They, they would have been a foundation for uh, an agricultural workers union in the states had the American Federation of Labor not excluded on the basis of race, namely Japanese. In Hawaii, they actually built the labor movement in Hawaii, where, which was the first place that labor rights were won uh, for agricultural workers. So, you know, we have benefited from immigration. And we're in the midst of a big debate, a big struggle right now over what the future of our country is and how it's going to look. And there are people who are very fearful and others of us that are very hopeful. Uh, and that's kind of the moment, I think, the kind of moment it is. Thanks for asking that. Yeah. I th thank, you. <coughs> Excuse me. thank you very much, Marcia. Very, very inspiring. And, um, you know, I, I did my doctoral research on storytelling for organization change. Oh, really? Yeah. And I've never heard anyone articulate the whole process in, in such a sort of a fantastic way. So thank you very much. Thank and very much. I, I hope there's somewhere it's all written down so I can. Yes, kind of, okay, <laughs> great. And uh, you know, one of our most popular courses here is critical thinking. So I'm thinking maybe we I could start a course on story thinking to to kind of so we get the emotional plus the kind of cognitive that together. Would be great. Maybe we could do that. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> my <laughs> uh, my question. Um, one way to think about these, these kind of nar narratives or stories, so say for example in America, there's, you can think of country narratives, right? And you know, the kind of, I think in America, you can think triumphant individual, you know the work of Robert Reich, he's got his four, oh, sure, yeah? Sure, sure. Benevolent communities, the rot at the top and so on, and difference between Republicans and Democrats yeah. is which, which of those four stories they kind of tap yeah. into. Yeah. So in your work, um, you worked with blacks in, Mississippi, I think, yeah. and then the Mexican community, yeah. and then on Obama, Obama's campaign. Yeah. Were you kind of consciously tapping into these different sort of foundation narratives to connect with this self, us, and them? Is that part of your work? It's, it's an interesting question, and, and I think it's sort of, um, when you focus on drawing the narratives out of people, all that comes with it. <laughs> In other words, it's, it's little different than messaging. So like, now like if you were a consulting firm in DC, you would sort of say, hmm, what's the master narrative here and how do we sort of project this out there? If you're, if you're approaching it from a movement building perspective, you're out there engaging people and telling their stories. And you're, you're trying to learn from them where the, where the moral energy is gonna come from. And what you begin to, then you see where those narratives are. And, and where they are, they, one of the really powerful narratives in the U.S. is uh, there is a, there is a um, sort of a, a, you know, an American dream kind of narrative. Uh, there is a sort of uh, you know, hope through uh, betterment, improvement. Uh, th there's no question about that. Uh, th there, is, there is a religious narrative that's very strong, uh, this idea of uh, redemption uh, through struggle. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's very explicit in the civil rights movement, the Christian narrative was a core narrative. It was a story of pain, uh, suffering, 
a redemption. Uh, and uh, most uh, faiths have to deal with the question of pain. And then how do, you, how do you find hope through pain on the other side? They're not denials of it. They embrace it. And so in movements, that's a big issue because movements are full of struggle. And so religious narratives tend to be very, very important. In the US, I found in the civil rights movement that was critical. In the farm worker movement, there was a, a, uh, a Catholic, Mexican Catholic kind of narrative that was very important. Um, Dr. King, at the, you listen to the March on Washington speech, there's, there's an American dream narrative about that he's very articulate, and there's a Christian, a faith narrative, and there's a kind of racial justice narrative in there. So, yeah, they weave in and out. Now, Obama, if you go listen to those first seven minutes, which I'd urge you to do, it's on YouTube, the first seven minutes, he, he begins by telling his story, like where he came from, choices. But I should just say that stories are all constructed around moments of choice. See, a choice point is the center of a story. And it, because the protagonist is confronted by a challenge, there's a moment in which they have to decide what to do. And then there's an outcome. And so the choice point is the heart of the matter. And the way you bring a story alive is by bringing people into that moment of choice so they can see it, feel it, be there with you in that moment. So Obama cites a number of choices made, interestingly, by his parents that shaped him to be the person. Then he shifts, he says, my story is part of the greater American story. And he goes back to the Declaration of Independence, not the Constitution. He goes to the Declaration of Independence because it enshrined equality. Constitution did not. The Constitution enshrined inequality because of the recognition of slavery. And so he's choosing. But then he has a bunch of incident, uh, you know, so we can put our, our kids to sleep at night and, and know that they'll be okay. We'll, he has a, a, a bunch of moments like that, very everyday kinds of things. Then he shifts and says, but we have more work left to do, and that's the challenge. And then he cites a lot of examples of that. T take, so it, it is a kind of, um, these things are we woven together in a very natural way. I think the, the PR firms and the consulting firms get in trouble when they try to package it too much or brand it too much. Because I think all our alarm bells go off. We feel manipulated. Uh, and we feel like, like it's being packaged. And, we, and you don't have to because it's real. <laughs> uh, and it's out there. You just need to learn how to, how to, how to you know, tap into it and become good storytellers. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but yeah, no. Stories often are nested, you know. It's sort of this story is within that one, within that one, within that one. And but yeah, the overlap of faith narratives and, and national narratives and yeah. Can I can I just share just very quickly? Um, one of the things I found in my research about Japan is the narrative goes from disharmony to harmony. Mm. That's a very strong narrative here. Huh. Disharmony to harmony. Whereas in America, it's more poor to rich kind of. This is like oh, the American dream. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think the I think an interesting question. I mean, inter I have a lot of questions about how how change what the narrative of change is, because certainly uh, Japanese culture has has gone through enormous changes over time, uh, woven many different threads together in really unique and interesting ways. Whether the thread comes from China or the thread came from Korea, wherever the thread came from. And, and or whether it came indigenously, and then the way these things have been woven together, and that's a fascinating uh, process. I'd like to understand more about how, how, the, how the change happens, what, what, what initiates the change, because change is always uncomfortable. I mean, it, there's nothing comfortable about change. I mean, and, and so it takes uh, moral resources to find courage and find hope to deal with it. So I, I, I think there's just so much to learn there. One, one or two questions? Maybe either son and then son. Either son. Thank you so much for your presentation. <coughs> I think it's often leadership is talked about in terms of leader's characteristics. And at this time, you um, articulately, scientifically um, pointed out five things for leadership, and that was really great. And, uh, my question is. Um, do you have any example of these five practices practiced in corporate environment, like private sectors? And if you have an example of any successful uh, examples. No, you know, see, it's really interesting because um, I guess it was uh, three years ago. Um, uh, the, um, at, at the business school, the Harvard Business School, the new dean, uh, Nit Noria, uh, who works a lot on leadership, 
uh, he and another colleague of mine, Rakesh Kurana, and a guy named Scott Snook, uh, had, had a series of uh, conferences on leadership, uh, theory and practice of leadership, and that produced a, volu a book, <laughs> and then uh, teaching leadership. There was one on leadership teaching the following summer, and then the following summer there was one on values and leadership, uh, which are all really interesting. And, and some of the best stuff on, uh, I think, uh, getting serious about leadership studies that I, that I certainly, and I was asked to go to the first one, and I said, well, well I'm with business school, and uh, I do movements. And they said, no, no, come and do this. And so I talked about the social movement stuff, and what, there was a lot of interest that surprised me. Now, see, it's my ignorance of, of the private sector. Uh, but people were very interested in this whole notion of distributed leadership, of the significance of values, of collaborative leadership, of innovation and adaptation. I think it's a big, big issue. And so, you know, I, I hear from my colleagues, Deborah Ann Kona that runs a leadership center at MIT, uh, uh, colleague uh, Rebecca Henderson at the Harvard Business School, who work in the private sector about lots of exploration in this area. It's not an area that I have expertise on. But the sense uh, they talk about, uh, there are companies that they would mention that, see, this is my, ask me about movements, I'll tell you. Uh, I know uh, Gore is one company that, uh, that they work with, but uh, uh, that are involved in lots of experimentation in this area. I think, that here's, here's a challenge. Back in the 70s, there was a big uh, vogue of talking about uh, participatory management. Uh, Peters and Waterman produced that book, uh, In Search of Excellence, and uh, everybody was talking about participation. And they had a chapter in that book where they talked about motivation being linked to participation and autonomy. They proceeded then to focus entirely on mechanisms of participation. They ignored autonomy. And I think that the idea that we're going to create a sense of participation, but we're going to hold on to the control, that's a problem. That's not real. And it hasn't been real. And when it was tried, it often failed for that very reason. It wasn't real. How to come to terms with the fact that autonomy, I don't, by autonomy it doesn't mean just whatever you want, but it means a genuine scope of authority and decision making that's necessary for real responsibility so that power is more distributed than concentrated. And then how do you orchestrate common effort out of distributed centers of power rather than everybody does what I say? I think that's a big issue. And, and uh, yeah, and, and I think we're going to learn a lot uh, through the, what the private sector is working on in that. Well, in fact, I thought this about Globus. Relationship building, storytelling, strategizing, ah. action, and then structure. Well, this is what I'm doing. We have it right here. <laughs> See, this is this it. This is what I'm doing Good, from scratch. Great question. You know, like a relationship <laughs> building and, you know, like this is what I've been doing as an entrepreneur. Well, great. Well, anyway, uh, uh, Sven, Sven, okay, sorry. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the talk. I'm Sven, uh, I'm from Belgium, work here at Globus in Marketing. Uh, yesterday I was actually watching a, a show on YouTube about the social right movements during the 60s. Very turbulent times, but also a lot of bills were, were passed. And um, even in Belgium, my country, the 60s, was also yeah. a decade of revolution also in France. But here in Japan, when I look at the youth of Japan, there's a disinterest in politics disinterest in big change, they're complacent. Many are happy with the current status quo. I mean, it's economically stable, it's okay. But sometimes when I go to Southeast Asia, I went to Bangkok a few weeks ago, and I listen to the youth's voices, and they're much more active in politics, and they are engaged. So what could we do to have the Japanese youth once again interested in revitalizing their country, getting rid of certain politicians, etc.? Like uh, Yamanaka-san, let's have Yamanaka-san ask a question, <laughs> and then you can answer uh, from two of them. I have a different question. Would you give us some advice about uh, how to keep the motivation of volunteers? That's my question. Okay, you may go on. Five minutes. Okay, you want to dodge the youth question? I mean, well, I mean, because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was expecting you to be the youth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, just to not leave that, I think you have to ask... Japanese young people. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I think you have to ask Japanese young people. I mean, you know, I, I'm a great fan. Walter Brueggemann, uh, the Protestant theologian, wrote a book called Prophetic Imagination. He says that transformational vision occurs at the intersection of two, two elements. One is criticality, uh, which is a clear sense of the world's hurt, its pain, its limits. But the other one is hope, a sense of its possibilities and its promise. Uh, 
And uh, you know, my experience, my generation, certainly young people often come of age with a critical eye, often on what they find, almost of necessity hopeful hearts. And so, so there is a natural sort of energy for improvement, uh, for change. Now, sometimes it's stifled because it doesn't seem possible. And sometimes it's stifled for other reasons. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a core creative force. Uh, and, and I think robbing young people of hope is one of the greatest sins a society can commit. Uh, you know, where, where it's, I don't think that's the case here. I certainly haven't seen evidence of that. But I think that's a conversation to have with young people, not, not with me. Um, uh, the question was, um, oh, uh, sustaining motivation. Yeah, I mean, interestingly, again, in the literature that comes out of uh, a study of workplace design, uh, again, in the private sector, uh, there's great literature on uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation and how you design tasks so that they build in motivation. We know what the factors are. Uh, we know that uh, task, they're called task significance, task identity, skill diversity, autonomy, uh, and feedback. And, and if you design tasks in such a way, they become self-motivating. Now, what struck me was when I began learning this stuff in, when I was doing my PhD, over in the volunteer sector, people didn't know this. And so over in the volunteer world, people were having people do awful, boring, horrible tasks as tests of their commitment. And sort of say, well, if you're really committed, you'll do this boring thing over and over and over again. Rather than think, how do we make it not boring? Well, go over here and read about task design. I mean, it's all right there. And you can design then leadership ladders right from, you can take a phone bank or passing out leaflets and design leadership ladders simply by ratcheting up the autonomy, the task identity factors, the skill, the skill variety. So uh, we know how to do this stuff. Often we, we, have, we aren't taking the knowledge and putting it in places where it could be useful and thinking about it in sort of a fresh way. That research was almost all private sector uh, job uh, motivation research, but it's, it's of enormous use. Okay, uh, we have two more minutes. No more questions? Okay, great. Um, so how long are you going to be here for? Like, uh, are you going to be leaving sometime? Uh, till the 21st. I see. Uh, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how the politics will evolve in Japan because there are lots of going on. Yeah. New gen generation has happened. And then you know, after 20 years of bad economy, we, we feel very hopeful about yeah. what's going on. Tokyo Olympic is going to be here in 2020. And uh, lots of entrepreneurial movements going on. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great stay in thank Japan. You. And hope you come back again. Okay. And make a speech in front of us and hopefully in front of our students as well. Arigato. So thank, thank you. you very much. Let's give thank a you. hands up to Dr. Marshall Kanz.